So good to see you all, you who uh, have braved the heat to be here today and ignored the warnings of uh, your own cathedral leadership and came to church. Well done indeed. Thank you. There have been many times in my career, especially uh, there was a time when I was a campus chaplain for seven years, which meant I had my Sunday mornings free to go visit other Episcopal churches around the diocese. And I discovered, much to my confusion, that the more impressive the church I visited, the worse the preaching was. Have you ever discovered that? Trinity being the great exception, I think, to that general rule. And I began to wonder, what seminary did these preachers go to? What homiletics classes did they take? Well, now we know the answer. I offer to you the uh, recently discovered lecture notes from the first seminary homiletics course from St. Swithin's Seminary by the Sea, the course entitled Bad Preaching 101. <laughs> Good morning, class, and welcome to your first lecture, Bad Preaching 101. As you read in your seminary course catalog, this class is devoted to the time-honored art and practice of bad preaching in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> By the end of this course, you will have mastered the basic skills required to preach the radical and uncompromising gospel of Jesus Christ without risk of your actually getting crucified yourself. In this course, you will learn about these and many other useful techniques. Boredom as a diversionary tactic, <laughs> modern methods of academic evasion, including the uses and abuses of 19th century German terminology, mining the obscure riches of Bartlett's familiar quotations, how crying infants are your friends, and when all else fails, the magic of poor sound systems. <laughs> your grade will be based on class participation and your demonstrated ability to gracefully disarm any biblical passage that calls into question our beloved American values and lifestyles. To begin the course, I will be lecturing on the gospel reading assigned for this Sunday, Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. This is an especially alarming and challenging reading, which when interpreted carelessly is capable of inspiring fervent and discomforting moments of spiritual conversion among your charges. However, utilizing the tried and true methods that we shall discuss today, methods perfected and passed down over centuries of bad Episcopal preaching, these readings will be rendered safely impotent if not pleasantly numbing. <laughs> the three essential elements of bad preaching, and these will be on the test, so write them down, are as follows. One, the obvious theme. Two, the obscure exposition. And three, the impossible conclusion. We begin with the obvious theme. The best bad sermons begin not in their preaching, nor even in their writing, but rather in the selection of the sermon's theme. The best bad preachers never hesitate to choose the most obvious and time-worn theme that can be found. For example, Luke's Gospel today frequently expresses one of the most common themes of the Bible, the sin of greed. Today we hear that a rich farmer foolishly thinks he can store up all his grain in huge barns, enough grain to last him many years, thereby allowing him to spend his retirement years eating, drinking, and making merry. But Jesus says that very night, God brings judgment upon him, thus exposing his worldly goods as so many indictments against his soul. Well, obviously, in unskilled hands, this story would threaten to shame all of us who are invested in any kind of retirement fund. I personally intend to retire in just a few months. I plan to take every dime due me from the church's pension plan. <laughs> Thus, Jesus' story is potentially troubling. What is a bad preacher to do? 
obviously arguing with Jesus is to no avail. And giving away one's wealth is patently absurd. So no, instead, the good bad preacher begins by listing out the many of cliches, the many cliches that come to mind when reflecting on this theme, such as, you can't take it with you. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money cannot buy happiness, etc. The more cliches and tired aphorisms one can list, the better, because the more obvious and familiar the theme, the more likely will the congregation be lulled into thinking that they already fully understand the gospel story. The familiarity of the theme will be reassuring to them, especially when the tone of your voice smoothly communicates the false impression that that which is easily understood is easily accomplished. As a theme, the love of money is one of the grand old ladies of bad sermon topics. Your typical churchgoers will have heard this message so many times that they unconsciously believe they have it all figured out. Obscuring the profoundly difficult nature of the problem of, good, of greed and materialism in late stage capitalism. To many faithful Episcopalians, clergy included, this love of money theme is like a favorite old pair of bedroom slippers. They're comforting to wear inside the walls of the church, but are never meant to be worn on the streets of the real world. Never, and I cannot emphasize this enough, never make the mistake of, pretending, of presenting this theme in such a way that it threatens to become interesting, challenging, or useful. To be especially avoided are pithy quotations which rephrase the theme of your sermon in an arresting way. For example, Sitting Bull's remark that the white settlers' love of possessions was a disease to them, that should be put aside entirely. So too should the confession of the political operative Lee Atwater, who said while he was dying of cancer that the cause to which he had devoted his life, which was the acquisition of money, power, and prestige, that cause did nothing to fill the emptiness inside him. Don't mention that in your sermons. Of course, when reading your sermon before the congregation, and yes, in the Episcopal Church, all bad sermons must be read from a manuscript. That's the rule. Never attempt to bring Jesus' passion on this topic into your reading. For Episcopalians, emotion of any kind is profoundly disorienting. The bad preacher must always bear in mind that no matter how badly one preaches, at least the first minute or two of the sermon, you cannot avoid capturing the attention of the typical person in the pews. During that dangerous first minute or so, when the full attention of your congregation cannot be avoided, you should make every effort to signal to the congregation that you're not going to tell them anything they haven't heard a thousand times before. Remember, the more obvious the theme of your sermon, the sooner they will dismiss you from their thoughts and move on to the more important activities of surfing the internet on their phones and writing a check for the offertory. Once you have demonstrated your mastery over these first principles, we will explore the danger of too much success. That is, preaching sermons that are so bad, they actually become interesting. That must be avoided. Every bad preacher knows the feeling of dread that descends when having articulated the obvious theme in the first minute of the sermon, the preacher then faces many more minutes of airtime, during which time, he or she is expected to still say something that sounds impressive. This is when the preacher's many hours of seminary training prove invaluable. We thus come to the second essential element of bad preaching, the obscure exposition. Obscurity is the goal of every bad sermon's exposition. The best bad preachers develop their obvious themes with excruciatingly obtuse 
scholarship. This creates the delightful impression that the obvious theme is actually quite complex and worthy of a ponderous disquisition, the long academic essay into the exegetical, hermeneutical, and historical critical debates concerning the biblical text. Quotations from obscure scholars and historical figures are the ballast in the ship of bad preaching. All the better, of course, when quoted in the kind of learned, distant tone that suggests that the preacher had discovered the passage himself just the other day while leafing through the collected works of Josephus. For example, with respect to the biblical passage under consideration this morning, the bad preacher will be delighted to find in the reference books a dispute among scholars as to whether or not verses 16 to 21 should be considered a separate pericope from verses 13 to 15, and another discussion as to whether there is any evidence to suggest that the parables related to similar treatments found in Q and in the Gospel of Thomas. Remember, however, that it is not the goal of bad preaching to actually put the congregation to sleep. The good bad preacher must be entertaining enough to give the impression of competence in the pulpit, yet not so entertaining that people might actually remember the sermon upon leaving the church. Finally, the impossible conclusion. The impossible conclusion begins with the repeti repetition of the familiar aphorism, but now rephrased in the form of an impossible moral imperative by utilizing that most useful word, should. For example, indeed, the love of money is the root of all evil, therefore we should put aside all greed and covetousness and live our lives as God intended. Of course, the question of how one is to achieve the purity of heart and mind that the moral of the sermon prescribes, that's left unanswered. The bad preacher does not embarrass the congregation by addressing questions such as, how do we become the kind of person that Jesus wants us to become? How do we attain this freedom from the love of money that Jesus seems to think is so vitally important? the good bad preacher will ignore those questions as if their answers were obvious. The goal here is to leave the lingering impression with each member of the congregation that he or she is the only one who actually wrestles with these difficult questions. In all things, the bad preacher must strengthen the illusion that the congregation is filled with satisfied, spiritually competent people who already know the answers to these questions never encourage members of the church to explore their own despair or spiritual hunger. To do so is to walk down that dangerous path toward relevance. Maintain instead a wall of benign mystery with respect to the practical questions of the spiritual life. Remember, once members of your congregation feel comfortable discussing deeply personal and risky subjects like their own spiritual emptiness, they might recognize the same condition in you, and your placid professional cover will thus be compromised. At every opportunity, reinforce the impression that the spiritual journey is a lonely one that an Episcopal church is no place to seek spiritual companionship, that we come to the communion rail not out of our emptiness, but out of our worthiness, and that the heights of genuine spiritual fellowship cannot compare to the pleasures that are soon to be found at the coffee hour. With these and other methods expertly deployed, the preacher can then safely conclude his sermon by shifting his tone to one of great vocal gravity and with significant pauses so as to signal the imminent conclusion of his sermon. This concludes our first class. At the next lecture, we will discuss in greater detail the use of humor as an evasive device in bad preaching, your assignment is to read the first article listed in your syllabus 
entitled, Jesus Was Actually a Very Funny Guy by <laughs> Professor Franz Bittfeldt. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>